Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to Westplex Radio's uh, show that's uh, really catching on throughout the entire Westplex area and the region. It's called What About Nutrition? The show that explores the link between nutrition and optimum health and asks the overlooked question many times, what about nutrition? What about it? Every day there is more scientific evidence and research regarding the critical importance of nutrition for the promotion of optimum health in all of our lives. On What About Nutrition? This radio program will be a half hour. We'll discuss and focus on dietary supplements, herbs, vitamins, and homeopathic remedies, what they are, what they do, and how to use them. We'll also discuss diet, exercise, and other aspects of living a healthy lifestyle in the 21st century. Your host, sitting beside me, is Mr. Nutrition himself, <laughs> David Gall. Now, David is the owner of O'Fallon Nutrition and a graduate of Washington University and Huntington College of Health Sciences, Sciences Comprehensive Nutrition Program. Now, remember, always consult your health care practitioner before beginning any new supplements or other changes in your lifestyle. The purpose of the show is to inform educate and entertain not to diagnose treat or prevent any disease and uh, good morning David how you doing buddy oh, I am doing great Steve how are you this morning really good a lot of buzz about this show we're very excited to present it uh, it's heard uh, it's heard every Saturday morning uh, and Sunday morning on Westplex radio on Saturdays it's on Westplex News Talk 941 and on Sundays set at, at the same time at 10 o'clock that's right. It's heard uh, on uh, 100.7 FM. So uh, if you miss it on Saturday, catch it on Sunday on 100.7 FM. And, of course, every Saturday at 10 a.m. to 1030 on Westplex News Talk. So we've been really rolling. We've been talking about oh, yeah. a lot of things here on the show. Great stuff. What do we have for today? Well, as you remember, last week we talked about, uh, we kind of followed up on the neurotransmitters and brain chemistry and uh, wrapped up the show with a little tiny discussion on hypoglycemia, which is a great thing for us to get into today. Um, and of course, hypoglycemia is the fancy term for low blood sugar, and it relates to mood in the sense that when our blood sugar is low, uh, our brain becomes unstable, literally. Uh, blood sugar, of course, is the only fuel that the brain can use, as we've learned over the last few weeks, with the exception of the amino acid glutamine, um, or if somebody does the Atkins diet and they go into ketosis, if I've got anybody that's getting nitpicky out there, the brain can use that. Mm -hmm. But basically, it lives off of blood sugar. So um, hypoglycemia is a very common thing, and a lot of folks have familiarity with it, but they don't necessarily understand exactly what it is. Right, but you they know? can feel it. Right, exactly. That's definitely true. Um, so first, I'd like to to describe what uh, situation creates a hypoglycemic event in most people. So hypoglycemia refers to low blood sugar. And um, here's how you create a low blood sugar situation. Generally what happens is it's preceded by a spike in blood sugar. Mm -hmm. And that's what a lot of folks don't understand because they think of sugar as the cure for hypoglycemia. Oh, I have low blood sugar, so I need, I need more sugar. Mm -hmm. it, it seems like the logical thing. Um, and um, even harder to understand is that temporarily, if you have low blood sugar, eating some sugar temporarily will make you feel a little better and get you out of that danger zone. Of course, it'll create a danger zone that's going to come up again in just a half an hour or so. Yeah. And that's what we're going to talk about. So here's how you spike your blood sugar, which is going to lead you to a hypoglycemic event. All you have to do is eat carbohydrates alone. So mm -hmm. let's say that we eat a piece of white bread. So we eat this piece of white bread, and um, we chew it up, and we swallow it. Can I put some jelly on it? If you put jelly on it, that's going to make our example even better. <laughs> so let's say, let's. Uh, in fact, we used this example with staff at the store a couple yeah. weeks ago discussing it. Yeah. So white bread with jelly on it. So we've got starchy white bread with some sugary jelly, and neither bread nor jelly is really a source of fat or protein. So mm -hmm. we've got pure carbohydrate. We've got some complex carbs from the bread, and we've got some simple carbohydrates from the sugar and the jelly. Okay. So we eat those and we chew them up, and an enzyme in our saliva called amylase goes to work on the starch in the bread. And starch is simply a chain of sugars stuck together. So everybody hears about carbohydrate, and they hear about sugar, and they'll hear that carbohydrates are sugar, and so what does this mean? Okay, so sugar is simply one or two molecules stuck together. That's considered a simple sugar or a simple carbohydrate. And complex carbohydrates like starches, which is what we'll find in things like bread or potatoes or pasta, starches are chains of sugar stuck together. That's all they are. So um, you've got a chain of sugar stuck together, and this enzyme in our saliva, in our spit, called amylase, mm -hmm. breaks the little bonds that hold the sugars together, and once you break those little bonds of the starch and the white bread, for example, you're left with sugar. 
Mm -hmm. And that enzyme starts doing that in your mouth, which is why bread becomes a little sweeter as you chew it. Right. Or folks have done that experiment where they chew a saltine cracker and it becomes sweet by the time they've chewed it up. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we swallow it, and now there's sugar in the stomach. And uh, jumping forward, it gets absorbed quickly into our bloodstream. Mm -hmm. Fat and protein take a while, but sugar can be absorbed through the wall. Excuse me, absorbed through the walls of the stomach. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we absorb the sugar. Our blood sugar goes up. Okay. Now is where it gets interesting. The body has to protect the brain from getting poisoned by excess blood sugar levels. So just like too little blood sugar is bad, excess blood sugar is toxic to brain cells. So of course the body would want to protect us from that, right? Right. Okay. So the body, when it senses this elevation in blood sugar, the pancreas senses that and it releases insulin in response. So now the insulin's in our bloodstream and insulin's job is that it's the key that opens receptors on cells to get them to accept sugar. Okay? Fascinating. And what it does is when the cell opens up because insulin is the key, it dumps the sugar into the cell. So we can either dump sugar into muscle cells, or if the muscle cells don't want it, it'll go to the liver. So the insulin hooks up with the sugar, it takes the sugar to the cells, it knocks on the door, and it says, hey, do you need any sugar? And if the cell is full of sugar, if we haven't burned any sugar off, then the cell will say no. It can't accept the sugar. And then insulin has to take the blood sugar to the liver. And what we do is we make fat out of it at that point. Mm. Or we make cholesterol out of it. This is another factoid for this week. So uh, excess sugar in the blood, if it can't be absorbed by cells because they're not hungry, gets taken to the liver, and the liver either makes these long-chain saturated fats, which are bad for us, or it makes cholesterol out of it. Um, and I touched on this concept of insulin resistance as well. So the cells, if they're not hungry, which means you haven't exercised, or in other words, they are full of carbohydrate, right. they just won't accept it. Um, insulin tends to do a little bit too good of a job when it does this. So this is the next con- uh, connection in terms of what happens when we get this low blood sugar. Okay. So whether the cells accept it or whether it has to go to the liver and get turned into fat or cholesterol, either way the blood sugar tends to come down too low. The insulin works a little too well. So now we've got low blood sugar and we have all these symptoms um, like foggy brain and low mood and uh, instability. It gets difficult to think. Um, We might develop things like drowsiness or exhaustion or faintness, dizziness. You can also get really anxious at this point. So what does the body do when blood sugar is really low to counteract that? And Steve, I'll teach it to you because I'm not sure if you can. (laughs) I'm not sure. You know, I'm following you. Right, right. Some of these things I knew, but I didn't know the mechanics behind it. Exactly. Which is why it's kind of, it's not the most exciting thing in the world, but it's really important to understand these mechanics because by the time we're done today, it's going to tie it all together so that folks know how to adjust their meals so that they don't spike their blood sugar. Right. And what I'm getting at in a simple sense is that when you spike your blood sugar, it's always going to come down too low. We call that the crash. Exactly. That's the crash. And insulin takes it down a little too low. Meanwhile, where did the sugar go? It's usually getting converted to fat. Yeah, ouch. Okay. If you're lucky because you've been smart and exercised, it will go into the muscle cells. But otherwise, it's getting converted to fat. Okay. Anyways, blood sugar comes down too low. And now what happens is your adrenal glands have to kick in. And this is where it gets even more interesting. So blood sugar gets too low. Now we're hypoglycemic. Okay. So this is this person. Everybody knows them. Oh, I have low blood sugar. Oh, I'm a hypoglycemic. Mm -hmm. And what they've got to understand is that nine times out of ten, you get to become a hypoglycemic by spiking your blood sugar in the first place. Yep. Okay. So anyways. Blood sugar is low now, and the adrenal gland has to kick in. So in order to keep us from running out of fuel for the brain, because the brain's got to have a little blood sugar, the adrenal glands kick in and release a big surge of adrenaline, just like uh, fight or flight, like if we were a caveman and getting chased by a saber-toothed tiger. Right. Okay? So adrenaline comes out. Adrenaline causes the liver to release stored carbohydrates. So now this crazy thing happens where adrenaline causes the liver to release some carbohydrates into the blood. That brings blood sugar up a little bit, which helps us feel a little better, except now we've got this big adrenaline surge, right? Right. Imagine if you're a little kid and you get fed a high-carbohydrate, low-fat, low-protein breakfast like a granola bar for breakfast, okay, or a Pop-Tart, or, um, you know, something like a sugary cereal, 
Okay, so what happens is that kid, their blood sugar goes up after that breakfast and they feel pretty good for a little while. Then they're sitting at school a couple of hours later and because it was an easily digested, low fat, low protein breakfast, the blood sugar got too high Yep. and now it's crashing. And so at first the kid feels kind of faint and nervous. I mean, I hope that kid's not taking a test right now. Yeah, that's right. But anyways, as they're feeling faint and nervous, their adrenal glands start to kick in and release this adrenaline in order to bring, excuse me, bring blood sugar up. Okay, so now this child has a blood sugar um, coming up, but they have an adrenaline surge is what I'm getting at. Uh-huh. Can you control yourself if you're a kid and you have this massive adrenaline surge? <laughs> no. Often you can't, okay? <laughs> no. And this is implicated. This is a connection to things like ADD and ADHD in particular. Mm. Uh, the child gets this huge adrenaline surge, and that adrenaline surge is telling them to move and to do stuff because that's what adrenaline does, and it's very difficult for them to even avoid it. So what we want to do is not spike blood sugar in the first place. Um, when we do, it comes down too low, the adrenals have to kick in, then we get an adrenaline surge, which can make us do all sorts of wacky things. You've heard of, you know, defenses where, uh, you know, somebody murdered somebody and they did the low blood sugar defense, for example. Yeah, exactly. And the element, the kernel of truth in that is that the uh, adrenaline surge can be so intense for some people that they almost do literally go crazy. It's definitely a moment where people can go into rage or have panic attacks or anxiety Mm. attacks, uh, not to mention just poor thinking, headaches, that kind of thing. So when we come back uh, in the next segment, I will try to tie this together and we're going to discuss some supplements and some eating and lifestyle habits that can be really helpful in stabilizing your blood sugar. All right, folks, I'm Steve Casper alongside David Gall, Mr. Nutrition of O'Fallon Nutrition in O'Fallon, Missouri. You can find them on the web at www.ofallonnutrition.com. We'll be right back. We're going to take a short break. You're listening to What About Nutrition on Westplex Radio.